Okay, in this video I'm going to talk about my second book, Cruelty. There is this set of processes, psychological processes, which I've lumped together under the name of otherization, which include things like stereotyping, ostracism, verbal abuse, all the kinds of processes that work together to split people apart, to differentiate them. And what we seem to um, see when that, when that happens, when otherization takes hold, is that it's, it's a sort of a cyclic process that just spirals, it gets worse and worse and worse, if it's not stopped. And the earlier you stop it, of course, the better chance you have of it not taking root. But we also see that those systems seem to change the way the brain reacts to other people. So for example there are social networks, if you like, areas of the brain which are particularly involved in processing information about other human beings. Um, areas such as the medial prefrontal cortex and the insular and the cingulate gyrus and they seem to process not only emotion related information about how we're feeling but also information about what other people are saying and doing, information about their facial expressions, for example, and there seems to be a mechanism in the brain to give you the kind of empathetic understanding of those people. For example, we seem to have areas of the brain that are particularly involved in processing other people's movements and speech and facial expressions and almost, if you like, modelling them in our own brains as if they were ours, and it seems to be that link that makes us feel connected to other people when we, for example, synchronise our movements. But also there's the emotional side of it as well. When you behave in a certain way, you trigger emotions. When you see other people behaving in a certain way, that can also make you feel emotions and so you have empathy. So empathy and theory of mind seem to work together to make us feel very connected to human beings, but only some human beings. And the classical psychological term here is the distinction between the in-group, which is people like us, and the out-group, which is them. Now, mostly we all have multiple in-groups and out-groups, and that's a good thing, because if you only have one in-group that matters, you can get very, very focused on that, and it can be rather unhealthy. So most of us have multiple in-groups. We have our work colleagues, or we have our friends that we go down to the pub with, or we have our identity as, in my case, I would think of myself as a writer and a neuroscientist, etc, etc. So we have these multiple in-groups and multiple identities and other people who share those we tend to accept and people who don't we tend to dismiss. However, if you get, for example, a clever ideologue who can come along a politician and insert a wedge between you and your out-group, then you can start developing extreme hostility between those groups and that can be very useful politically but it can be very damaging to relations between those groups. And what happens when you get that kind of spiralling otherization? What happens is that the people in the in-group start viewing the people in the out-group differently. You don't get the same brain activity as you did when there were, when you're, for example, talking to an in-group member. It's almost as if they are processing the outgroup member as if they are less human. If you use, um, if you look at the language that people use about hostile outgroup members, they talk about them um, metaphorically as beasts or animals. They talk about them metaphorically as cancers or diseases, infections, swarms, insects. You get a whole set of language that is very, very hostile that is depicting these people. You also if you ask someone to describe the outgroup member in terms of their emotional life, get a much more simple description. So instead of saying complicated things about how you know they're feeling guilty and an intensely um, you know self-reflective and all this lot, you don't get any of that. You just get simple, basic, raw emotions being described. So everything dumbs down. So it's almost as if they're learning to see people as less than people, non-people, and that which has been called dehumanisation or objectification, or the various names for it, that is when it really starts to become potentially dangerous. Otherisation seems to happen in all cases of extreme cruelty. So from the boys torturing a kitten and throwing it on a fire, all the way up to the extreme horrors of, for example, wartime atrocities, you see this pattern of people distancing themselves from the target. 
And what's particularly interesting about that in scientific terms is that whereas you might think that the emotions that are driving that are primarily anger and fear, what seems to have emerged is that the primary emotion, perhaps, certainly one of the big ones, is disgust. You have to see your enemy as something revolting in order to be driven to commit the extreme acts of cruelty. And that's because what you're doing is you're basically seeing yourself as engaged in a cleaning function. You're seeing yourself as a perpetrator, and I know that's a really difficult concept for people, but bear with me here. You're seeing yourself as a perpetrator, as somebody who is doing a hygienic cleaning up a dirty task, but a necessary one because it's going to help, it's going to cure, it's going to heal overall. And that is the dangerous, horrible justification by, behind most of these acts of extreme cruelty. So, for example, the classic example is the Holocaust. Look at the language that the SS used, look at the language that leading Nazis used about what they were doing, and you find that metaphor of hygiene, of surgery, of cleansing coming to the fore again and again and that is what's so terrifying about extreme cruelty because fear is something that arises and then when there's no threat it dissipates anger is something that responds to a social offense but if there's no offense it's hard to sustain the anger but disgust it doesn't matter what the victim does because how do you cleanse yourself of perceived pollution it's really hard to do. So whatever the victim can do, I mean, if, if you're angry with someone, they can apologise. If you're afraid of someone, they can reassure you. But if you're disgusted by them, how do they deal with that? So disgust is a really powerful and dangerous mechanism. So one of the arguments that the book makes is that we have to be very careful about the language that we see, for example, in politics, and to stamp down hard on any language of disgust because it can be so dangerous. And you do still come across that kind of metaphor, even for example, in British politics, you'll have people talking about, you know, swarms of immigrants coming over. Well, you know, that's not a neutral term. You've got to watch that kind of thing.